Hey, everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Women's Fittest. I'm super excited to have Sarah Ford Bishop here with me today. She is one of the prominent coaches in the industry right now and one of my favorite people to talk to about evidence-based just things going on in the industry. So first of all, how are you doing today, surviving the Florida heat? I am good. It is, yeah, we are June 28th here, so mid summer um i know it was like technically officially the first day of summer last week but it's been summer for a while here so i trained this morning and um definitely sweated my ass on off however you want to look at it for leg day um but yep yeah, just uh kind of do it doing my thing over here nice nice well i was kind of thinking about so you and i had this discussion about hey, maybe we could make this be a more regular series and what would the premise be? And I really like the idea of sort of myth busting or trend busting. So we're going to talk about things that we kind of hear on a regular basis. They might be things that are trending. It might be things people use as, let's say, excuses why things don't work out for them. And Um, we're just going to kind of attach some validity to that. If it's relatable, if these are things that we practice, if we don't, if we recommend them for clients and that type of thing. So each episode, we're going to try to do one monthly and cover three or four sort of trending topics or topics that we think are kind of relevant and try to bring in some of the evidence as well as our anecdotal uh, evidence and experience and just discuss. So um, yeah, you thought that sounded like a good idea as well and something you could make time for. Yeah. Cause I feel like we've been just going back and forth, like DMS or texting about, you know, like, Hey, what do you think of the last Huberman podcast? Or did you see that study on, you know, um, hip thrust versus squats and stuff like that. And I think there is like a lot of information on social media, not always education. So I think there is like a difference between just people posting stuff and then people like educating or people talking about like, how is this practical? So I think that's where we wanted to really kind of tie things in and yeah, just talk and it's your podcast. So share your opinion and I'll share mine. So yeah, absolutely. If um, I just want to recommend like if people are looking for some of the people that are posting some of this more like some of the latest evidence and that type of thing, I would say, look at who Sarah is following, look at whom I'm following. And we are following a lot of those same, same people. And they are posting like the most relevant studies or things that are kind of maybe hitting um, the news or social media or trending or whatever. So um, you can just kind of follow those and get things from the source because I'm not a researcher. I'm getting my information a lot of times from somebody else who is getting their information from. So we just, we just kind of find people we trust that we follow. And that's, you know, I know Sarah, you kind of delve a little bit more into reading PubMed articles and that type of thing, probably more so than I do. So, yeah, but I like, and honestly, it's just like my time for that. Like, you know, I don't always have the time for that. So yeah. Yeah. And you can get into huge rabbit holes following, like looking at different articles. That's my issue when I do that is I will be there for an hour and suddenly I'm down a rabbit hole like I didn't start in, but yeah. Yeah. And this is what I love because a lot of the people we follow will post these meta analysis. And so they are looking at the sum of the information to be able to draw Um, you know, the, the most relevant conclusion to like, whatever is happening based on the, the information that's out there. And so they're kind of doing the work for us and we're just passing the information along until it's updated or new information comes out, which is really how it works. (laughs) Especially in our field. Like, I think that's what people need to realize is like, yeah, like there's certain things, like we're starting to have like pretty good evidence on like protein, you know, like, uh, recommendations, you know, for athletes or or resistance training. But then when you talk about like things like, you know, like different protocols for training, like, you know, lengthened, you know, versus, you know, doing partials versus full range of motion. It's like, you know, I feel like a lot of this stuff is like hot and like trendy. And it's like some of this stuff we don't have, you know, we have, we know a lot about 
certain things, but then we're still kind of uncovering details. Yeah. Um, and I think people get lost in the details and then forget, like back to that training example, mechanical tension, you know, is going to be number one still, um, as far as like muscle growth goes. And a lot of these kind of new research or new kind of things people get into it's, it's the details, right? Yeah. And you have to find out what's relevant to you because it, whether you said training in the stretch position or the lengthened position it, for a specific exercise, it might work out better for me to get a better, um, you know, a better full contraction or whatever in one way or another, even if the study says this works better for most people, you still have to look at things like in on an individual basis. Or I mean, an example, people talk about like sucralose and if if artificial sweeteners are bad for you or good for you and I feel like a lot of that is so we don't really know and it's very person dependent like if you if you have artificial sweeteners and it upsets your stomach then you're probably a person who shouldn't be consuming those because it's not gonna you know work well for your digestion but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're bad for everybody or you know whatever so always, always caveats, always variables. It's always very individual as well. So I think, um, I want to, I actually want to start with, um, the protein one, because it is always one that people always want to know. And, um, I think this is information that I, I kind of known and stuck with for the same, with the same amount for quite some time, but people still ask the question. So, you know, how much protein, I guess I would say the variable should be like as an athlete, as somebody who is weight training, let's say, um, you know, what would you put into the range of somebody who's weight training? Like maybe three. Yeah. Let's say, let's say at least three days a week. Okay. Yeah. So you're actively doing weight bearing exercises three, at least three days a week. Um, I know it's always in, um, it's not in pounds. It's in, um, <laughs> then we say kilograms. Yeah. For, I usually go off pounds. Like I usually do that, do the conversion. Yeah. And, and give that recommendation. But I know that's just the U S that, you know, grumbles <laughs> about the, why you have it in kilograms. <laughs> I know we're the only one who's like metrically different than like everyone else in the whole entire world, but yeah, we're so bougie here in the USA, whatever. <laughs> so, um, I mean, so I usually just say uh, to make it simple, I'll say one gram of protein per, per pound of, I would say body weight or lean body mass. If you are, you know, quite overweight. Yeah. I'm saying like, that's, you know, the range that I give people is 0.8 to 1.2 and what's right in the middle of that one gram. So yeah, one gram per pound or per pound of lean body mass. Now people get tripped up off that like lean body mass, like how, well, what, if, like, am I overweight? Like, am I like how lean is lean? So, you know, I think it just kind of depends like as a, as a female, like if you're over like 27% body fat, and you can like just Google like, you know, pictures like female body fat, you know, percentages. And you'll see all these pictures of like just kind of examples. Actually, Menno, um, Menno Henselman, he, his website, um, he's got some like kind of visuals of like, this is what females look at, like roughly at this body fat. And this is what men look like. So you kind of use a chart like that to just kind of estimate, you know, your body fat percentage. Um, the other thing you could do is if you are like overweight, um, or obese go off your goal body weight, you know? Um, so that's, that's like an easy, you know, easy target. Right. And I mean, a lot of people, I think underestimate that. I think we know when we have clients and you've got a woman who weighs 180 pounds and she'll be like, well, I want to weigh 125. And I'm like, okay, honestly, I don't really know any adult woman that weighs 125 pounds, but I mean, realistically, it's just a very people, I think often pick a low number. So, I mean, on average, I could say most women can get away with aiming for around 150 grams in a day. I don't know if you would say if you would be okay with that within. Yeah. Reason. I would say like thinking about my clients right now, most of my clients are between 120 and 160 grams of protein as far as my females go somewhere in that range. 
Yeah. So um, a couple of questions people might ask is, um, you know, can you have too much protein? You know, is this bad for your kidneys? This was a, a myth, I guess, that has been going around for a long time that protein was bad for your kidneys. Do you even know where that came from or why that was a thing? You know, I'm not sure why. I'm wondering if it might have been because if you do eat a high protein diet, you might have a high creatinine blood, you know, and, and it can be reflective in your blood um, and lab work when you're eating a high protein diet. And without knowing that you're eating a high protein diet, without knowing that you're resistance training or have more muscle mass, those values could be, you know, alarming. Um, and yeah, like there is like, we do know that if people that have kidney disease or people that don't have fully functioning kidneys, there are considerations for protein, right? So I think that's maybe where like concerns, you know, kind of have come up um, previously. But if you have healthy kidneys and, you know, even maybe if you don't, you know, talk to your doctor about it, um, you know, and find, you know, the best you know, amount for you. But yeah, definitely, I would say myth for most. Yeah. So I, I want to talk just a little bit about maybe somebody would say, well, what is the minimum amount that I can get away with? Um, you know, what there have been studies on very high amounts. I don't think they're for they've been for very long term, but the the studies did show that there was really no issues with kidneys or anything like that, even three or four grams per pound of body weight. So yeah, the the study I'm most familiar with, I think they did 4.4 grams per kilogram, which is going to be two grams per pound, roughly. I, if I have that that right, those numbers right. Um, and yeah, they saw no issues, you know, with safety. I think the issue for me, like as a coach or like practically with people going too high protein is a lot of times people will go so high protein at the expense of carbohydrates. Um, so a lot of people think like that are informed, you know, that protein means energy, but protein is building blocks is how you want to think about it. And carbs and then fats are going to be more energy carbs, especially for resistance training. So say you are, let's just have even numbers here. Say you're 150 pound female and you're 23% body fat. And we have your protein at 200 grams that's a lot of protein and, you know, your calories, your total daily calories might be around 2000 If 200 grams, you know, that's 400 calories coming from protein. So if you're training hard, like we may not have the carbs there to support optimal training. So lowering the protein to like one gram per pound and putting those calories towards carbohydrates, you know, you might have better training, better, I mean, you know, better digestion, a lot of things, you know, potentially, um, with just kind of having a more reasonable protein intake. Yep. And I want people to understand too, that it doesn't mean like, cause people will talk about, oh, protein is very thermogenic and it's very satiating. And this is all true that it is more than the other, um, other, uh, macronutrients, but, uh, you can still over consume it just like anything else. And like you said, you want to have a good balance with all the macros, according to what you need. One of the things I wanted to mention is with you going with what is the absolute minimum, you could possibly be shortchanging yourself, not just with not having enough building blocks to help with muscle repair and um, retaining lean tissue, but also, um, you know, just those things that like, allow you to be satiated and stick to a diet. This is one of the main things that I think is a problem. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about um, carb addiction and if that's a real thing, but um, to kind of hop to that, I had gotten into a um, a conversation with someone on an Instagram post and he started talking about what you know he thought he was carb addicted and this was why but he was saying he was on a vegan diet and to me that was a huge red flag just because most people like being on a vegan diet is is very difficult 
you have to be very knowledgeable about nutrients to make sure that you're getting everything that you need in combinations, especially protein, because you're probably getting proteins from, from combinations of, um, amino acids. So, you know, to me, I was like, if your protein is too low in your diet, you are likely not going to be regularly satiated and you could be craving food a lot. And if you're mostly eating carbs, you're going to want to be eating, like you're just going to be constantly getting a blood sugar spike and drop and wanting to be eating more, more carbs. Right. That makes sense. Yes. So I think that's, that's a good point. It's like, are you addicted to this food or are you not putting together balanced meals and, you know, you're having, you know, cravings or you're like you said, riding this blood sugar, you know, high and then crash. And in that crash, your body is like searching for quick food to bring it back up. And what's quick sugar, (laughs) simple carbs, right? So like, it's like this vicious cycle. Um, so yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's a great point about like not searching for the minimum with protein. Um, and I do think like people, I think addiction is like a term that gets thrown around or people like have almost like a, a victim mentality toward the food. Like I am, or, or I am powerless, you know, against this food. And for me, that's kind of like a red flag a little bit. Um, like, no, you know, I'm not someone that says, or necessarily thinks that you have to, you know, be able to eat one cookie, you know, every single day. And like, you know, like, I think maybe if you know yourself and you know, you don't have the greatest control around cookies, like, yeah, maybe you don't keep, you know, a box of Oreos in the house at all times. Right. Um, maybe you save it for a special occasion, but I do think just this idea or this is kind of victim mentality and maybe that's not the right word, but this kind of mentality toward food like that is, is problematic. Um, you know, in in addiction, just that term, like we don't, we have, you know, addiction to substance, uh, there's substance abuse, you know, disorders like, you know, alcoholism, drug addictions, but we don't have the same DSM five, the same diagnostic criteria for food. Um, that's not to say it doesn't exist. And there's definitely like, there's different, um, questionnaires and different, um, forms out there, like the Yale, um, I'm going to get it wrong. So I don't want to say it, but there's a, there's different like surveys and stuff that they do screen for these addictive, like behaviors around food. And we know that definitely exists. I mean, we're both coaches. We know that exists. Um, but I think to label it an addiction is potentially problematic. Um, I think they have seen in like rat models where there is addictive like behavior when you have a carbon fat food, which makes sense. Like when we think about a cookie, it's there's fat in there too, right? So it's the carb and the fat versus somebody binging on just okay. white bread. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or almonds, right? It's like not as, not as, um, there's not as much like a, a hedonistic kind of drive toward that, those kind of foods. Right. And, th- and there's a lot of other factors that are involved too societally. Like we might look at, if you've been taught to look at foods good and bad, then you might look at them as something that's off limits, which would make you crave them more when you're stressed out. You could look at things like past, you know, past trauma. Um, if you have issues with um, social relationships and these types of things, and you tend to you know, I loosely say have a more addictive personality where you use different things as coping mechanisms. So you could be using, you know, you could be using cigarettes, you could be using alcohol, you could be using food to try to soothe, um, you know, yourself in stressful and anxious situations and that type of thing. So like, there's so many things that are to be factored in. And I feel like, you know, you and I talked about this before too, with the labels, it's, it's nice to have a diagnosis of something, but it still doesn't relieve you of your responsibility to make a change or put effort into it. And nobody has, you know, nobody who was on a fitness journey just had it like completely easy. And to assume, like, I always think like, like my, my body is not like a newspaper headline, it is, um, like, 
what was I going to say? Like, I have like this, like, I, I feel like you don't like, you don't know my story. You can't judge my story just based on what my body looks like. So right. like, you can't judge a book by its cover. Right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, um, yeah, so it might be like, yeah, like it might be like a newspaper headline, but it is not like the, t- it's not the cover of my, my story. Like there's way more that I have experienced and been through. And to me, when I'm saying like, I don't really believe in like that you, you know, it, it sounds awful. I don't believe that you might have a sugar addiction or that you have a problem. It's me saying like, this is something that is way more overcomable than you think it is. And we probably don't even have to label it. We just have to look at your past history and the things that you're doing and, and, and find solutions to the problem. So I like, well, and you brought up a great point with it being a coping mechanism. I mean, I mean, absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And I think that's where like having alternatives, right. That are, are maybe, you know, a better choice for you, or actually maybe more truly comforting long-term, um, you know, so that might mean journaling, you know, it, it doesn't always have to be like journaling. People are like rush to that. I think and they're like, Oh, they're going to make me journal. Um, you know, like, but no, it could be something like, you know, calling a friend, like having a gratitude practice time outside, you know, the gym, um, the gym absolutely can be abused too, but, um, I think, you know, it, it is, um, oftentimes, you know, something deeper, like something more like psychological, um, and is it a true, like addiction, like a drug addiction is like, I don't think we know, or can say that yet, but I do think it's something to, to dive into and, and yeah, like ask yourself, you know, what else maybe support you need and maybe, you know, therapy is an option, you know, there's lots of tools out there. Yeah. And I, I like people to ask themselves too, is this something that I want to actually quit doing? You know, is this something I actually want to change? Because a lot of people will cling to something because it's easier to continue down the same route, even if it is um, detrimental to their health than it is to change. I mean, this is why we live in a very sick society. It's just because the effort that it takes to make a health turnaround is albeit rewarding um it's it's difficult it's very difficult to stop ingrained behaviors things that i've always done and a lot of times you know i've said this before too people don't recognize that what they're doing is problematic until symptoms start showing up and this could be after decades of doing what they've been doing what they've always been doing so yeah. i think you and i are great examples though of people that I and mean, we both have histories of um, eating disorders and fitness struggles. And for people to think that like, they could just look at us and go, Oh, the gym just comes naturally to you. Like I literally said to my daughter last night, I go, I bet you 75% of the time, I do not want to go to the gym. I I kid you not. It's probably 75% of the time. Like, I don't want to go. I'm like, I should go to the gym today because I am a responsible, healthy person. And I want to stay like as a healthy person. So, and I love it. You know, I love going there. I love once I'm done and everything, but to like, you know, I'm usually tired and work and everything else. I I really don't want to do it. It's just become something that I do because I know it's good for me and I know I feel good when I'm done. So it's that phrase that the, the fit girl likes cookies just as much as the, (laughs) overweight girl you know yeah Yeah, we just make different choices right exactly yeah and I I mean yeah it comes down to like choices and like values I mean you value yeah going to the gym you do value your health you value being strong you know and you know I think that's that's the biggest thing is like aligning actions with values um because when they don't align that's when we probably feel like shit about ourselves you know even not even physically but like you know internally like mentally yeah. Yeah. You're like, I'm not a person that, yeah, I know. I mean, when I was a smoker, the la- that was the last bad habit really that I quit was smoking. And I had somebody say that to me, like you do all this healthy stuff. Like, why are you smoking? That doesn't even make sense. And I'm like, yeah, it doesn't align with the path that I'm trying to create for myself. So is that what helped you change? Yeah. I think just, it, and I just, 
I mean, it's a disgusting habit, right? But I also started started going towards the direction of wanting to, it wasn't just about being skinny anymore. And I think people had that mentality of like smoking helps you. Oh, yeah, help your appetite. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so when I was like, oh, I, I got into weight training and I'm just like, oh, I'm building muscle now. Like I wasn't so afraid of gaining weight, uh, whether, whether it was body fat or muscle at that point. And so, but yeah, no, it was just, uh, somebody had pointed out to me. Um, it was a guy that I was dating after I was divorced and he was just like, this doesn't even make sense. Like you're smoking and everything else about you is like trying to be healthy and, and all this stuff. And I was like, yeah, yeah it doesn't. And I just, you're right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And I just, but you're right. But like, I mean that, but that's, I mean, again, like that's like, I work with a lot of people like that, where it's like, I know what I should be doing, but I'm struggling to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so that's, I mean, when you think about it, you know, you're not so alone, you know, with, with a lot of those. Yeah. those thoughts. And that's where I am like so big on my clients, like their internal dialogue or like what they say to me, like, I'm so lazy. I keep going to get fast food. And it's like, whoa, like, let's stop that. Because now you're telling me lazy, you're lazy. Now you're going to start doing things that quote, lazy people do not get your steps, not go to the gym, continue this vicious cycle, and then feel bad about yourself because lazy is a negative term. And, you know, instead, maybe we talk about, Hey, maybe you're not lazy about cooking. Maybe you just don't like cooking. I don't like cooking either. I'm a very lazy cook, but I cook in a healthy way. So Yes. I like, like just kind of reframing things like that, I think is like helpful. And then you can change your behavior, right? Like you can start buying, you know, maybe the microwave rice or use your microwave to steam veggies or, you know, the crock pot to shred some chicken. Like that's very hands-off. It's very quote lazy. Um, but you know, it, it doesn't, you know, just perpetuate this narrative that I'm a lazy person. Yeah. And I, I think just evaluating where you are, like sometimes people, they get burnout or they need to take breaks or rest or something major in their life is just causing you to put, I mean, I've had it several times in my life where fitness has been put on the back burner and like, not to the point where I just let myself go completely, but I mean, maybe a little bit, but <laughs> Like there, there was, I look back and I was like, Oh, I got pretty chunky for a time there. <laughs> well, yeah. Like priorities. Like, I mean, I had a client the other day say like, Hey, at this stage of my life, like my family is the most important thing. And it's important to me that I'm not training on the weekend, you know, or, you know, have certain, you know, kind of parameters around the time, you know, that I'm training on the weekends. And I'm like, heck yeah. Like let's adjust like good stuff. Yeah. When you can, can, you know, continue on the bare minimum with certain aspects, I think that's, that's a win in itself. And you just have to tell yourself, you know what, I will be able to get back to this at a different level when the time comes. And I think the key is just to not be in caught in like guilt and shame when you're making these, because even if you like, I mean, we've talked about this with food stuff before, you know, the worst thing about like deviating from a diet, like you're going to go out and you're get ice cream is like, you have to be okay with the choice that you made. It's just, it's so much worse. If you walk away and just like, Oh, I should not have eaten that. Like ruined my, like this whole mental, you know, you're just like, no, it's, no, like I'm actively choosing to have the ice cream cone like I want this and then you're done with it 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 doesn't have to take out that much more mental space yeah yeah absolutely so I, a lot of it but you know it's, I mean to the same respect too you can't keep lying to yourself if you're continuing with behavior either so there's a fine there is a fine line between like acceptance or this is for this amount of time um or like if you just go like well, fuck it. I'm just going to do, you know, like you, you can't always have that, that yeah. either because you're going to get yourself so far from your goal that it's going to be a terrible track back on track. So, um, yeah, no, yeah. I totally agree. 
Yeah. But this is why, you know, even like, I mean, with clients, this is just why as an individual, it's really important to evaluate all the different aspects of what is like, what is going on, what you're capable of for, you know, this hour or this day. I mean, you might be able to look at your week and just go, you know what, there's no way that I'm going to get a workout in or, you know, I've had home workouts. I hate home workouts. Like they're not fun. They're not efficient. They're not, they're not as effective. Like they're not something that I can program. Um, but I mean, sometimes, you know, I never, you know, five or so years ago would have thought, oh, something is better than nothing. But this is the stage of life where I am, where I think more about health rather than just always about building muscle. And right. oh no, like because my workout isn't going to be perfect. I skipped four days. Like that's horrible. No, like, you know, <laughs> is, yeah. You know, very, you know, it can be very impactful. Yeah. Right. Right. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, it's, it's constantly adjusting with your environment in the flow of your life and everything else. So, yeah, I don't know what we were, we were talking about, um, protein and carbs. <laughs> <laughs> Protein, carbs, food addiction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I just, I do think though, that as far as like addiction goes, um, I just think we need to be really careful about throwing those types of words around too. Um, because like you were saying about words do have, they have a lot of weight to them and you're going to really believe everything that you tell yourself. And so I say like, give yourself power. Always make, choose words that are going to give yourself power over your life. Um, sometimes you have to fake it till you make it too. You know, you have to kind of lie to yourself. Like you said, um, you know, don't tell yourself that you're lazy. Tell yourself you like to prep things a little bit more simply. So what is a simple way of doing, you know, this food prep or whatever it is, there's, you can always reframe these words so that they're positive. Yeah. I'm big, big on the reframes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the last few decades have really been like, ugh. I mean, some of us nineties kids really grew up with some, <laughs> like, you can't believe we talked to each other that way, you know, or some of the things. That oh, we some talk- of the words we called each other. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that I won't say on the podcast, but yeah. <laughs> I know it's crazy. All right. Well, um, so we were going to talk about what else? Oh, genetics, which was like, I feel like that's a good final topic for today. Yeah. Yeah. So what kind of got me thinking about this was, um, well, like I showed like my daughter, some pictures. I, I had one on my Instagram story yesterday, um, from when I got married. And so I, I was an athlete my whole life. Uh, And then I just like became like a walker and I wasn't really eating a whole lot when I was basically anorexic. And, um, so I was like 108 pounds at five, five when I got married. Um, and all I did was walk. I walked like six or seven miles a day and not even like a high protein diet or whatever. And I was quite muscular. So like, do I have good genetics? Yes, I believe that I do have good genetics for holding muscle, for building muscle, um, et cetera. So I'm not really going to be offended if somebody tells me that I have good, you know, genetics for this particular case. There's other things that I don't have good genetics for. And I feel like it's really important to understand that your journey might be easier in one respect and more difficult than another in another respect than somebody else's. And so just to group like, Hey, somebody has good genetics. Sometimes people can be offended thinking they didn't have to put work in. And I think we know that anybody who's embarked on a fitness journey has had to put work in. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Like, yeah, especially like people talking about like pros and like seeing the pros it's like, Oh, it's their genetics or you know, like I could look like that way too, if I just took some gear and it's like, no, the fuck you couldn't like, sorry. Like, (laughs) but it's like, you know, you have no, like people have no idea. Like, yes, genetics, like, yes, super supplementation, but a lot of work too. A lot of, a lot of reps. 
Yeah. And we know, like, especially, I mean, when I think of genetics, like I, I said to you before the podcast, I think of like muscle insertion and, um, you know, even like what people are capable, like what they are capable of walking around, even as a natural yeah. athlete. Yeah. Um, or where you store fat. I feel like that's a big one for like women, especially like most women, you know, it's like kind of hip spies, but like some women like just genetically, like, you know, have bigger boobs and like, that's where their, you know, fat goes or, you know, like, I feel like, like I definitely store fat in my butt. So like that kind of helps my shape in a building season, you know, where my stomach tends to stay flatter and it goes more to my butt and thighs, you know? Yeah. Um, but you know, whereas someone else, it might go more to their stomach. Right. Or yeah. Yeah. It's, it is fat, fat storage is very interesting for sure. Because yeah, you're right. Like some people just, you know, I mean, some people just genetically store belly fat a lot more than other people. And that makes it more difficult or even in contest prep, if you don't have like an overall nice distribution, it does make it really hard. Like we, we both follow Renee Jewett. We both know that she stores a lot of fat in her lower half. And so her upper body is like ridiculously shredded and her and her lower half still has body fat to get off of. So, yeah. Right. Which is like, you know, but then she also has the genetics, you could argue, like to have the amount of muscle mass that she has. But yeah, I think just getting caught up with the genetics. I mean, there was there's one of my favorite studies to kind of cite on this. They um they had two groups, right? And there was it was actually a a cardio fitness test. So they had them both do the same like endurance kind of protocol. And um then they tested their genetics and they told one group that they had the the good gene for exercise performance. And then they told the other group that they had the bad gene for, uh, for performance. And then they had them redo that same cardio test. And the group that was told that they had the bad genetics performed worse on that second test than they did the first time and worse compared to the group that was told that they had the good genetics. Now, bringing it all back to testing the genetics, this was, they did actually test their genetics, but they didn't necessarily tell the people that had the good gene that they had the good gene, right? This was, this part was kind of randomized. So some people had the quote good gene, but they were told they had the bad gene and their performance suffered as a result, you know, and, and vice versa. So like that just goes to show like it's, it's mental, right? You know, it's so much of this is, is mental and it's, you know, effort and it's how much effort are you going to, you know, put in? Like, I think, you know, maybe you do have, you know, I'm somebody, I don't have great muscle building genetics. If, you know, I, I put on a lot of muscle despite that, I think. And I think I also have better genetics than I once thought because I have finally over the last two, three years, given myself a chance to really build muscle, you know, and really, you know, you know, been consistent in a building phase and not going into a cut. Oh, I don't know if you can hear that, but Oh, sorry. No, we got a delivery. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I think that just is, you know, it's again, back to, you know, the addiction kind of thing, you know, it's what you say to yourself matters. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's huge. And there has been so many studies about that, that show like whatever they tell people is what they believe. I mean, they've done that with even steroid, um, you know, steroid tests as well. They've told like guys that they got, got, um, shots of testosterone when they didn't, and they performed better because they thought they were given steroids. They've had even, even physiological function of the body. Um, you remember the milkshake study where they, oh, yeah, yes. <laughs> yes. What was it? They gave people. It was, they told one group that they had like a super high calorie fattening, shake and the other one they told it was them it was like a nutritional shake or something I think yeah and yeah there was like a higher blood sugar response in the group that was told that they had like the super fattening one um and like stuff like that like it's wild right, there's even one study where they did a um a knee surgery and they told one group that they got the new knee surgery and the other group they told them um or no, they both. So one group, they actually did the surgery and then the other group, they just like went in and made like an incision, but they didn't actually do the surgery. 
And, you know, the group that didn't actually have the surgery just had the little scar. They, you know, still recovered or, you know, I'm going to, I'm butchering that study a little bit. So look it up after fact check me, but along those lines, those were the results. Yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, even when I was um, getting some dry needling done, a lot of those testing as well, because they were looking at people who got cortisone shots, like in an affected area versus um, they would have like the same type of results just with a needle inserted. So they're like, we're not even sure if it is the actual cortisone that is being injected, injected, or the fact that there's a needle going into, you know, it's like, is it mental? Is it just the needle that's helping rehab the particular area? So yeah, there's a lot of things. So it's funny, Sarah, I think the takeaway from this is just, you have a lot more power over your life and the outcomes. Um, Oh, I, you know what, that's what I was going to say too about genetics. I forgot to mention a lot of the stuff, even if they are, you know, like trauma stuff can be tra- passed on and different, different things can genetically be passed on um, health wise, but diet and exercise are huge overcomers for a lot of these health markers that you might have. And so just because, you know, you're told that, you know, I mean, diabetes runs in your family or this or that or whatever, just know that you have a lot of power in changing your health outcomes just by doing, I would say even the minimum as far as diet and exercise goes. Like you don't have to be weight training five days a week, progressive overload, getting ready to step on stage, hundred percent clean diet. Like there's so much that you can do just by doing the the bare minimum as far as your health, as far as your health goes. Absolutely. I agree with that. And I think people get overwhelmed, you know, and, and lost in the weeds, especially like, again, like talking about the people that are just looking, you know, to improve their health, to feel better, you know, and they get overwhelmed with like, oh my God, like I'm hip thrusting. Is that bad? Like, should I be squatting? And it's like, that's a different topic. Yes. I do think you should squat if you can, but you know, yeah. Is it, 1.2 or one gram per pound. It's like, doesn't freaking matter. Just, you know, right. Write out some of the noise. I think like cleaning up your social media feed and like, you know, kind of simplifying things there can be helpful. Um, yeah. and just, you know, kind of starting to apply some of this information because a lot of this is, is an experiment. You know, even if you have a coach, a lot of it is us throwing something at you and, you know, hoping it sticks. There's a little bit more consideration to it and a little bit more nuance, but kind of what a lot of this uh this is but yeah Yeah. I mean back to the genetics thing and and like your health I mean genetics you know load the gun but then you know your environment pulls the trigger right is is the the saying yeah yeah I love that I just yeah I think you just have you have so much power over of over these outcomes I mean you know even like I would say even my quitting smoking I'm sure that I mean, I can't live two lives, but I'm, you know, if I quit smoking, I mean, if I hadn't quit smoking, like I just, I don't even know if I would be still continuing down this path of health and fitness because it could have taken over in some way or another, you know, chronic sickness or anything like that. Or, I mean, you know, you never know. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, well. Yeah. Well, that's just our encouraging word for today. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I feel like, no, I feel like this is a good one. I think we got some good um, ideas for future episodes, but yeah, I think everything today kind of circled back and tied into one another. Yeah, and I'm sure we'll re-mention different stuff because everything sort of, it's just all kind of connected in different ways. So, um, but if anybody has any um, anything that they want us to talk about, um, I was going to say, uh, you know, how people are like, I, I want to say, like, don't do something because you heard that maybe it's bad, but people do it. And like, I think like squats, for instance, people will be like, oh, squats are bad for your knees. I'm like, why don't you try this exercise and see if you like it? And it's something that is going to maybe work out for you, you might end up loving it. Like, who knows? Rather than just going, oh, I heard that this is bad for you. Like, people are so scared to even like delve into something because of some obscure, whatever that they heard that they, you know, they don't even 
forward them. Yeah. Or use it as an excuse. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're following people who like take their shirt off in the grocery store and tell you that things are bad, then like you should not, <laughs> those are the people to unfollow. Right. <laughs> or the people that do that. And then they're like, oh, you eat a cookie every day. <laughs> Understand that they also, you know, train their ass off and, you know, whatever, like there's like all this different stuff, you know, that, that goes into it. Yeah. Yeah. Which is kind of what we're trying to talk about is this is kind of what the evidence says. This is what we do. This is what you can do. Um, uh, I mean, it is trial and error. I, no matter how much you are directed with your fitness journey, it's still going to be a ton of trial and error and an evolution with with aging, with lifestyle, with environment, with everything that's going on. Like it's constantly evolving. So even if you know something or even if you're set in a way, you're going to have to make adjustments along the way because things are always changing. So, yeah. And for me, I mean, that's the fun of it all. Like is <laughs> seeing it that way, right? Seeing it as, you know, something that's always going to evolve. Yeah. Cause I, well, I think that in the core of it, we're problem solvers. And so, I mean, that's the positivity of it. To me, I'm like, you know, like there's always going to be problems and I'm always going to be up for finding a solution. Like I always, I always am like, I'm always game for, for that. So, I mean, and that's, that's the roller coaster of life. I love it. I love that. <laughs> for gluttons, for, for struggle and punishment. So <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. All right. Well, thanks everybody for listening and watching to another episode of the Women's Fittest. Um, Sarah and I will be back in a month doing more myth busting, trend busting, providing you with evidence based information so that you can make good choices for yourself. But we want you to remember that healthy looks different on everybody. Have a great day.